Chapter 1 Arrival at Wuthering Heights In the year 1801, Mr. Lockwood, a gentleman from London seeking solitude and respite from the bustling city life, rents a remote property called Thrushcross Grange. Enchanted by the rugged beauty of the Yorkshire Moors, Lockwood desires a place where he can retreat into peaceful contemplation and escape the complications of society. Little does he know, his desire for solitude will soon be disrupted by the enigmatic and tumultuous world of his landlord, Heathcliff. Lockwood's first few days at Thrushcross Grange are uneventful, filled with quiet walks on the moors and reflections on his recent move. Curious about his surroundings and eager to acquaint himself with the local gentry, he decides to pay a visit to Wuthering Heights, the neighbouring estate owned by Heathcliff. The name alone evokes a sense of foreboding, conjuring images of wild storms and desolate landscapes. Lockwood sets off on foot, navigating the narrow, winding paths that lead to Wuthering Heights. As he approaches the estate, he is struck by its imposing and austere appearance. The house is a formidable stone structure, battered by years of relentless weather, standing resolute against the fierce winds that sweep across the moors. The gate, flanked by grotesque stone carvings, creaks ominously as he pushes it open and steps onto the overgrown path leading to the front door. His initial knock goes unanswered, and he hesitates, feeling an inexplicable sense of unease. He knocks again, more forcefully this time. The door is finally opened by a surly servant, Joseph, whose stern expression and brusque manner immediately make Lockwood feel unwelcome. Joseph's dialect is thick with a local Yorkshire accent, and his words are curt and uninviting. What do ye want? Joseph demands, eyeing Lockwood with suspicion. Taken aback but determined to make a good impression, Lockwood introduces himself and explains his intention to meet Heathcliff. Joseph grudgingly allows him inside, leading him through a dark and narrow corridor into the main hall. The interior of Wuthering Heights is as grim and unwelcoming as its exterior, with heavy wooden beams, dark panelled walls, and an oppressive atmosphere that seems to weigh down on Lockwood. In the dimly lit hall, Lockwood encounters Zilla, a reserved maid who regards him with a mix of curiosity and wariness. She quietly informs him that Heathcliff is in the parlour and ushers him into the room. As Lockwood steps inside, he is met by the cold and penetrating gaze of Heathcliff, a man whose presence is as commanding as it is unsettling. Heathcliff is a tall, dark-skinned man with an air of brooding intensity. His eyes, deep and shadowed, seem to bore into Lockwood's soul, and his demeanour is one of barely restrained hostility. Despite the chilly reception, Lockwood tries to engage Heathcliff in conversation, hoping to learn more about his landlord and the history of Wuthering Heights. However, Heathcliff's responses are curt and dismissive, revealing little about himself or his past. Lockwood soon realises that his visit is not welcome, and the tension in the room becomes palpable. The young woman he had seen earlier, who he later learns is named Catherine Linton, enters the parlour briefly, casting wary glances at both Heathcliff and Lockwood. Her presence only heightens the sense of mystery and underlying conflict that pervades the household. Feeling increasingly uncomfortable, Lockwood decides to cut his visit short. He makes his excuses and prepares to leave, but a sudden storm has whipped up outside, making the journey back to Thrushcross Grange perilous. Heathcliff, seemingly indifferent to Lockwood's predicament, offers no assistance or hospitality, forcing Lockwood to navigate the treacherous weather on his own. As he trudges back through the storm, Lockwood's mind is filled with questions about the strange and hostile atmosphere at Wuthering Heights. The inhabitants, 
their relationships, and the dark energy that seems to emanate from the very walls of the house leave him both intrigued and unsettled. He resolves to uncover the secrets of Wuthering Heights, driven by a mixture of curiosity and a desire to understand the turbulent world he has inadvertently stumbled into. Little does Lockwood know, his innocent curiosity will draw him deeper into a tale of passion, revenge, and haunted souls, forever altering his perception of the peaceful solitude he once sought on the Yorkshire Moors. Chapter 2 The Ghostly Encounter Determined to better acquaint himself with his landlord and perhaps uncover some of the mystery surrounding Wuthering Heights, Mr. Lockwood decides to pay a second visit to the isolated estate. The weather is grim, with heavy clouds hanging low over the moors, but Lockwood is undeterred. He sets out in the afternoon, making his way along the now familiar path, oblivious to the gathering storm. As Lockwood approaches Wuthering Heights, the wind picks up, and flurries of snow begin to fall. By the time he reaches the front gate, the snow is falling thick and fast, quickly covering the ground in a white blanket. Lockwood hesitates momentarily, considering whether to turn back, but his curiosity propels him forward. He knocks on the door, hoping for a warmer reception than his previous visit. To his surprise, it is Zilla, the reserved maid, who answers the door this time. Her expression is slightly less forbidding than before, though still guarded. Lockwood explains his predicament with the weather and expresses his desire to see Heathcliff again. Zilla reluctantly lets him inside, clearly aware that the worsening storm would make any journey treacherous. Once inside, Lockwood is ushered into the parlour, where he finds Heathcliff sitting by the fire, his expression as stern and unreadable as ever. The atmosphere in the room is as oppressive as before, the flickering fire casting long shadows on the walls. Heathcliff greets him with a curt nod, making no effort to hide his displeasure at the unexpected visit. Lockwood attempts to engage Heathcliff in conversation, but it is clear that his presence is unwelcome. Heathcliff's replies are monosyllabic, and his demeanour remains cold and aloof. Lockwood senses that any attempt to pry into Heathcliff's past or the history of Wuthering Heights would be futile, so he shifts the conversation to more mundane topics, hoping to pass the time until the storm abates. As the evening progresses, the storm outside intensifies. The wind howls around the house, rattling the windows and creating an eerie soundtrack to the evening. Lockwood glances outside and realizes that leaving tonight would be impossible, the snow is now several feet deep, and the visibility is almost zero. He reluctantly asks Heathcliff if he might stay the night, a request that is met with a frosty silence before Heathcliff grudgingly agrees. Zilla leads Lockwood to an upstairs bedroom, its decor as stark and unwelcoming as the rest of the house. The room is cold, and the bed, though serviceable, offers little comfort. As Zilla prepares to leave, Lockwood notices a small, dusty book on a shelf by the bed. Intrigued, he picks it up and discovers it is a diary belonging to someone named Catherine Earnshaw. Curiosity piqued, Lockwood begins to read the diary, finding entries that span several years. The diary reveals a tumultuous and passionate life, filled with references to Heathcliff, whom Catherine clearly loved deeply. The entries are filled with a mixture of affection, despair, and a sense of entrapment, painting a picture of a young woman torn between her desires and the harsh realities of her environment. As Lockwood delves deeper into Catherine's writings, he becomes absorbed in her story, losing track of time. The wind outside howls even louder, and the snow beats against the window panes, adding to the growing sense of unease. Eventually, exhaustion overtakes him, 
and he falls into a fitful sleep, the diary still clutched in his hand. His sleep is disturbed by a vivid and terrifying dream. In the dream, Lockwood finds himself in a desolate, windswept landscape, surrounded by the moors. A faint, ghostly figure appears in the distance, slowly making its way towards him. As the figure draws closer, he sees that it is a young girl, her face pale and gaunt, her eyes filled with desperation. She reaches out to him, her voice a haunting whisper, pleading to be let in. Let me in. Let me in, she cries, her voice echoing in the wind. Lockwood tries to move, but he feels paralyzed, rooted to the spot by an inexplicable fear. The girl continues to approach, her expression growing more desperate and sorrowful. Finally, she reaches the window of the room, her hands pressing against the glass, her eyes locked onto his. Please, let me in, she begs, her voice breaking. Terrified, Lockwood wakes with a start, his heart pounding in his chest. For a moment, he is disoriented, unsure if he is still dreaming. The room is cold and dark, the only sound the howling wind outside. Then he realizes that the cries have not stopped, they are real, coming from the window beside his bed. He turns slowly, dread filling his veins, and sees the ghostly figure of the girl at the window, her face twisted in anguish. With a scream, Lockwood leaps from the bed, his shout reverberating through the house. His cry awakens the household, and moments later, the door bursts open to reveal Heathcliff, his face livid with anger. Lockwood, still shaken, tries to explain what he saw, but Heathcliff cuts him off, his rage barely contained. How dare you disturb the peace of this house? Heathcliff roars, his eyes blazing. Get back to bed and leave my household in peace. Lockwood, trembling, can only nod and retreat back to the bed. Heathcliff lingers in the room for a moment, his eyes scanning the window, a look of pain and longing flashing across his features before he masks it with anger once more. He slams the door behind him as he leaves, leaving Lockwood alone with his fear and confusion. Unable to sleep, Lockwood sits on the edge of the bed, his mind racing. The ghostly encounter has left him deeply unsettled, and he finds himself pondering the significance of the apparition and its connection to the diary of Catherine Earnshaw. He resolves to learn more about the tragic history of Wuthering Heights and the mysterious figures that haunt its halls, even as the storm rages on outside. As dawn breaks, the storm begins to subside, and Lockwood, exhausted and shaken, makes his way downstairs. The household is silent, the events of the night seemingly forgotten or ignored by its inhabitants. Lockwood takes his leave, making his way back to Thrushcross Grange through the snow-covered landscape, his mind filled with questions and a growing sense of foreboding about the dark secrets buried within Wuthering Heights. This unsettling experience marks the beginning of Lockwood's deep involvement in the lives of the inhabitants of Wuthering Heights, setting the stage for the unravelling of a tale filled with passion, vengeance, and the restless spirits of the past. Chapter 3 Nellie's Story Begins Back at Thrushcross Grange, Mr. Lockwood finds it difficult to shake off the unsettling experiences of his visits to Wuthering Heights. The ghostly encounter, coupled with the enigmatic characters he met, fuels his curiosity and drives him to seek answers. The memory of Catherine Linton's apparition and the palpable tension in Heathcliff's household leave him with a sense of unresolved mystery. Determined to uncover the history behind the eerie events and the people involved, Lockwood turns to his housekeeper, Ellen Nellies Dean, who has lived in the area her entire life and knows both Thrushcross Grange and Wuthering Heights intimately. 
One evening, as they sit by the fire in the cosy parlour of Thrushcross Grange, Lockwood broaches the subject, eager to learn more about the inhabitants of Wuthering Heights. Nellie, Lockwood begins, I had the most peculiar and disturbing experience at Wuthering Heights. I can't seem to make sense of it, and I was hoping you might shed some light on the history of that place and its residents. Nellie, a middle-aged woman with a kind face and a no-nonsense demeanor, looks at him thoughtfully. She has seen much in her years of service and knows the story well. With a slight nod, she agrees to share what she knows, sensing Lockwood's genuine curiosity and the need to unburden her own heart of the heavy memories. Very well, Mr. Lockwood, Nellie begins. The story of Wuthering Heights and its inhabitants is a dark and complex one, filled with sorrow, passion, and cruelty. I have been involved with both families for most of my life, and I can tell you what I know from the beginning. Nellie settles into her chair, her eyes distant as she delves into the past. She recounts how Mr. Earnshaw, the patriarch of Wuthering Heights, brought home a dark-skinned orphan from Liverpool one stormy night. The child, whom he named Heathcliff, was found wandering the streets, hungry and destitute. Mr. Earnshaw took pity on the boy and decided to adopt him, much to the surprise and dismay of his family. Mr. Earnshaw had a kind heart, Nellie explains, and he treated Heathcliff as one of his own children. But not everyone welcomed the newcomer. Hindley, Mr. Earnshaw's son, was particularly resentful. He saw Heathcliff as a rival for his father's affection and grew increasingly jealous. Despite the initial resistance, Heathcliff quickly formed a close bond with Catherine Earnshaw, Mr. Earnshaw's spirited daughter. The two children became inseparable exploring the moors together and sharing a deep, almost mystical connection. They understood each other in ways that no one else did, their bond transcending the ordinary friendship of childhood. Catherine and Heathcliff were like two halves of the same soul, Nellie continues. They shared a wild and untamed spirit, finding solace and freedom in each other's company. But Hindley's jealousy festered, and when Mr. Earnshaw passed away, Hindley took over the estate and began to exact his revenge on Heathcliff. With Mr. Earnshaw's death, Hindley returned from college with his new wife, Frances, and immediately asserted his dominance. He relegated Heathcliff to the status of a servant, stripping him of his privileges and treating him with relentless cruelty. Hindley's harsh treatment was a stark contrast to the loving care Mr. Earnshaw had shown, and it only served to deepen Heathcliff's resolve and hardened his character. Under Hindley's rule, Wuthering Heights became a place of misery for Heathcliff, Nellie says, her voice tinged with sadness. He was no longer allowed to be educated alongside Catherine, and his days were filled with hard labour and abuse. Yet, Despite Hindley's efforts to break him, Heathcliff remained strong, driven by his love for Catherine and his desire for revenge. Nellie describes how Catherine's relationship with Heathcliff grew more complex as they matured. Catherine, though wild and passionate, was also drawn to the refined lifestyle of the Lintons, the wealthy family living at Thrushcross Grange. An incident in which Catherine was injured and taken in by the Lintons for several weeks marked a turning point in her life. She emerged from her stay with the Lintons more polished and with a growing admiration for Edgar Linton's genteel ways. Catherine's time with the Lintons changed her, Nellie explains. She began to see the world differently torn between her wild love for Heathcliff and the allure of a more civilized life with Edgar Linton. It was a conflict that would ultimately lead to tragedy. Nellie's voice softens as she recounts the deepening rift between Heathcliff and Catherine. 
Despite their profound bond, Catherine's attraction to Edgar Linton's world created a barrier between them. Heathcliff, feeling increasingly alienated and humiliated by Hindley, was further wounded by Catherine's divided affections. The passionate and tumultuous relationship between Heathcliff and Catherine began to unravel under the pressures of societal expectations and personal vendettas. Lockwood listens intently, captivated by Nellie's vivid storytelling. He senses that the tale of Wuthering Heights is far more intricate and tragic than he had initially imagined. The characters, with their intense emotions and complex relationships, seem almost larger than life, their fates intertwined in a web of love, hatred, and revenge. As Nellie continues her narrative, she describes how Hindley's descent into alcoholism and despair further destabilized the household. His wife, Frances, died shortly after giving birth to their son, Hareton, leaving Hindley even more embittered and abusive. Heathcliff, though still a servant, harbored a growing desire for revenge against Hindley and the entire Earnshaw legacy. Hindley's cruelty and neglect of his son, Hareton, only added to the tragedy of Wuthering Heights, Nellie says. Hareton grew up in a chaotic and loveless environment, shaped by the bitterness and violence that permeated the house. And Heathcliff, who had once been an innocent child, became consumed by his thirst for vengeance. Nellie's recounting of these events paints a picture of a household steeped in suffering and animosity, where love and hate are inextricably linked. Lockwood is struck by the intensity of the emotions and the stark contrast between the pastoral beauty of the moors and the turbulent lives of those who inhabit Wuthering Heights. As the evening draws to a close, Lockwood thanks Nellie for sharing her story, though he is left with a sense of foreboding about the dark history she has revealed. He realizes that the events at Wuthering Heights have far-reaching consequences, shaping the lives of everyone connected to the estate. Intrigued and deeply moved, Lockwood resolves to learn more, knowing that Nellie's tale has only scratched the surface of the mystery surrounding Heathcliff, Catherine, and the tragic legacy of Wuthering Heights. With these thoughts in mind, Lockwood retires to his room, the flickering fire casting shadows on the walls. The wind outside has calmed, but the storm within his mind rages on, filled with the echoes of Nellie's story and the haunting images of the past. He falls into a restless sleep, dreaming of the wild moors, the tragic figures of Heathcliff and Catherine, and the timeless struggle between love and revenge that defines the legacy of Wuthering Heights. Chapter 4 Love and Betrayal As Mr. Lockwood continues to listen to Nellie Dean's story, he becomes increasingly captivated by the unfolding drama of Wuthering Heights. Nellie, sensing his deepening interest, takes a moment to collect her thoughts before delving into the next chapter of the tale, a chapter marked by love, betrayal, and the choices that would set the course for tragedy. After Mr. Earnshaw's death, Nellie begins, the bond between Catherine and Heathcliff only grew stronger, despite Hindley's relentless cruelty. Hindley did everything in his power to degrade Heathcliff, treating him as little more than a common servant. But no amount of harsh treatment could sever the deep connection that had formed between Catherine and Heathcliff over the years. Nellie describes how Catherine and Heathcliff found solace in each other's company, often escaping to the wild moors where they could be free from Hindley's oppressive presence. Their shared adventures in the untamed landscape forged an unbreakable bond, one that was as passionate and fierce as the storms that often swept across the heather. Those moorland escapades were their sanctuary, Nellie says with a wistful smile. They understood each other in a way that no one else could. Catherine's fiery spirit matched Heathcliff's own intensity, and together they felt invincible. 
but the world outside the moors had different plans for them. The turning point in Catherine's life came one fateful evening when she and Heathcliff were spying on the Linton family at Thrushcross Grange. They saw the refined and genteel life of the Lintons, a stark contrast to the rough and harsh existence at Wuthering Heights. Catherine's curiosity got the better of her, and she and Heathcliff ventured too close to the Grange. A dog attacked Catherine, and she was taken in by the Lintons to recover. The Lintons, though alarmed by the sudden intrusion, took pity on Catherine, Nellie recounts. They nursed her back to health, and during her stay, Catherine was exposed to a world she had never known, a world of gentility, refinement, and comfort. The Lintons, especially Edgar, were charmed by her spirited nature, and she found herself drawn to their way of life. Catherine's stay at Thrushcross Grange marked a significant shift in her character. When she returned to Wuthering Heights after several weeks, she was changed. Her wild and untamed spirit was now tempered by the influence of the Linton's cultured lifestyle. She began to appreciate the finer things in life and developed a newfound sense of propriety and elegance. Heathcliff, however, remained unchanged, Nelly continues. His time at Wuthering Heights had only made him more brooding and intense, his hatred for Hindley deepening with each passing day. When Catherine returned, Heathcliff was struck by her transformation. She was still the same Catherine, but there was a new layer of sophistication about her that both fascinated and troubled him. Despite these changes, Catherine's bond with Heathcliff remained strong, though it was now complicated by her growing attraction to Edgar Linton. Edgar, captivated by Catherine's beauty and vivaciousness, began to court her in earnest. His affections were sincere, and he offered Catherine a life of comfort and security that was in stark contrast to the turbulence of Wuthering Heights. Edgar Linton was a kind and gentle soul, Nellie reflects. He genuinely loved Catherine and wanted to give her the world. Catherine found herself torn between two very different loves, her deep, almost primal connection with Heathcliff and the promise of a stable, affluent life with Edgar. The conflict within Catherine's heart reached its peak when Edgar proposed to her. It was a moment fraught with tension and uncertainty, as Catherine grappled with the enormity of the decision before her. She confided in Nellie, revealing the depth of her internal struggle. Catherine confessed to me, Nellie says, her voice softening, that she loved Heathcliff with all her heart. She described their love as something elemental, as if they were two parts of the same being. Yet, she also recognized that marrying Heathcliff would mean a life of hardship and social disgrace. She wanted more than what the life at Wuthering Heights could offer her. Catherine's famous declaration to Nellie, one of the most poignant moments in their conversation, revealed the extent of her turmoil. I am Heathcliff, she had said, her voice filled with a mixture of passion and despair. He's always, always in my mind, not as a pleasure, any more than I am always a pleasure to myself, but as my own being. Nellie recounts how Catherine, torn between her love for Heathcliff and her desire for social advancement, ultimately decided to accept Edgar's proposal. She believed that by marrying Edgar, she could elevate herself and, perhaps, help Heathcliff in the process. It was a decision that was both pragmatic and heart-wrenching, made under the belief that she could somehow reconcile her love for Heathcliff with her ambitions. Catherine thought she could have it all, Nellie says, shaking her head. She believed she could marry Edgar, secure a comfortable life, and still keep Heathcliff close. But she underestimated the depth of Heathcliff's feelings and the impact her decision would have on him. 
When Heathcliff overheard Catherine telling Nellie that marrying him would degrade her, he was devastated. His love for Catherine was all-consuming, and her words, though not intended to hurt, cut him deeply. Feeling rejected and humiliated, Heathcliff disappeared that very night, leaving Wuthering Heights without a word. Heathcliff's departure left a void in Catherine's heart, Nellie recalls. She was heartbroken, believing that he had abandoned her forever. But she pressed on, determined to make the best of her new life with Edgar. The wedding took place, and Catherine moved to Thrushcross Grange, where she embraced her role as the lady of the house. Despite her efforts to adapt to her new life, Catherine was never truly happy. The luxuries and comforts of Thrushcross Grange could not fill the emptiness left by Heathcliff's absence. Her spirit, once so wild and free, became restless and unsettled. She longed for the passion and intensity that Heathcliff had brought into her life, and no amount of refinement or elegance could replace it. Edgar loved her dearly and did everything in his power to make her happy, Nellie says. But he could never understand the depth of her bond with Heathcliff. It was a love that defied logic and reason, something raw and elemental that neither Edgar nor anyone else could comprehend. Years passed, and just as Catherine began to accept her new life, Heathcliff returned. His absence had changed him. He was now wealthy and determined to exact his revenge on those who had wronged him. His return threw Catherine into a state of emotional turmoil, rekindling old passions and igniting new conflicts. Heathcliff's return was like a storm sweeping through Thrushcross Grange, Nellie describes. Catherine was overjoyed to see him, but also terrified of the consequences. Heathcliff, now a man of means, was determined to reclaim what he believed was rightfully his, and his presence disrupted the fragile peace that Catherine had tried so hard to maintain. Heathcliff's reappearance brought with it a whirlwind of emotions and actions. He began to sow discord between Catherine and Edgar, using his newfound wealth and influence to manipulate those around him. His vengeance was directed not only at Hindley, who was by now a broken man, but also at Edgar, whom he saw as a rival for Catherine's affections. Catherine found herself caught between two powerful forces, Nellie continues. On one side, there was Edgar who represented stability and security. On the other, there was Heathcliff, who embodied passion and chaos. Her heart was torn apart by the conflicting loyalties and desires that threatened to destroy everything she held dear. The intensity of these relationships and the choices made in the heat of passion set the stage for the tragedies that would follow. Catherine's decision to marry Edgar, made in the hope of securing a better future, ultimately led to her undoing. Her health began to deteriorate under the strain of her emotional conflicts, and the once vibrant woman slowly faded away, consumed by the very forces she had tried to balance. As Nellie's story unfolds, Lockwood is struck by the sheer magnitude of the emotions and events that have shaped the lives of the inhabitants of Wuthering Heights and Thrushcross Grange. The tale of love and betrayal, of passions that defy societal norms, leaves him with a profound sense of melancholy and a deeper understanding of the human heart's complexities. The chapter ends with Nellie pausing, her eyes reflecting the sorrow and regret of the memories she has shared. Lockwood, deeply moved by the story, thanks her for her openness and candor. He realizes that the history of Wuthering Heights is not just a tale of love and loss, but a testament to the enduring power of human emotions and the choices that define our destinies. Chapter 5 Heathcliff's Revenge As Mr. Lockwood eagerly listens to Nellie Dean's unfolding narrative, 
the complexity and depth of the story envelop him. Nelly's tale now shifts to one of intense emotions and calculated vengeance, centered around Heathcliff's return and his subsequent quest for retribution. This chapter unveils the darker side of human nature, where love, betrayal, and revenge intertwine in a tragic dance. Heathcliff's departure left a void in Catherine's life, Nellie begins. His absence was like a wound that never quite healed, but Catherine pressed on. She married Edgar Linton, believing that she could forge a new life for herself. Little did she know that Heathcliff's return would bring a storm that would upend everything. For three years, Heathcliff vanished without a trace. During this period, Catherine and Edgar settled into their life at Thrushcross Grange. Their marriage was one of affection and mutual respect, though Catherine's heart was forever marked by her profound connection with Heathcliff. Edgar, deeply in love with his wife, did his best to create a harmonious and comfortable home for her. Despite his efforts, he could not fully understand or erase the shadow that Heathcliff had left behind. Heathcliff's absence was a period of uneasy peace, Nellie continues. Catherine adapted to her new role as the Lady of Thrushcross Grange, embracing the refined lifestyle and the security it offered. But beneath the surface, she remained restless, haunted by memories of the Moors and her passionate bond with Heathcliff. Then, one fateful day, Heathcliff returned. His reappearance was as sudden and mysterious as his departure. He arrived at Wuthering Heights, transformed from a destitute orphan into a wealthy and imposing figure. The once downtrodden and mistreated boy now exuded an air of power and menace. The source of his newfound wealth remained a mystery, but it was clear that he had returned with a singular purpose, revenge. Heathcliff's transformation was startling, Nellie recalls. He was no longer the helpless boy who had suffered under Hindley's cruelty. He was now a man of means, driven by a burning desire to settle old scores. His first target was Hindley, who had fallen into a state of ruin and despair. Hindley Earnshaw, who had inherited Wuthering Heights after his father's death, had squandered his fortune and sunk into alcoholism. His wife's death had left him a broken man, and he had turned to drink to numb his pain. The estate had fallen into disrepair, and Hindley's treatment of his son, Hareton, mirrored the cruelty he had once inflicted on Heathcliff. Heathcliff's return marked the beginning of Hindley's downfall, Nellie explains. Heathcliff lent Hindley money, knowing full well that Hindley would never be able to repay the debt. It was a calculated move. When Hindley's debts mounted beyond his ability to pay, Heathcliff seized Wuthering Heights, taking ownership of the very place where he had suffered so much. With Wuthering Heights under his control, Heathcliff set his sights on Thrushcross Grange and the Lintons. He knew that his presence would disrupt the fragile peace that Catherine and Edgar had built. His return threw Catherine into a state of emotional turmoil, reigniting old passions and conflicts that had never truly been resolved. Catherine was both overjoyed and terrified by Heathcliff's return, Nellie says. She had never stopped loving him, but she was also aware of the darkness that had taken hold of him. His return threatened to destroy the life she had built with Edgar. Heathcliff's presence at Wuthering Heights began to have immediate repercussions. He ingratiated himself with Isabella Linton, Edgar's naive and sheltered sister. Isabella, captivated by Heathcliff's brooding intensity and mysterious aura, fell hopelessly in love with him. Heathcliff, seeing an opportunity to further his revenge, encouraged her affections. Isabella's infatuation with Heathcliff was a tragic mistake, 
Nelly continues. She saw him as a romantic hero, not realizing the depths of his vengeful nature. Heathcliff saw her as a means to an end, a tool to hurt Edgar and to further entrench himself in the Linton family. Despite Catherine's warnings and Edgar's disapproval, Isabella eloped with Heathcliff, marrying him and moving to Wuthering Heights. The marriage was a disaster from the start. Heathcliff treated Isabella with contempt and cruelty, using her as a pawn in his broader scheme of revenge. Isabella soon realized the true nature of her husband, Nellie says with a sigh. Heathcliff's abuse and neglect shattered her romantic illusions. She found herself trapped in a loveless and brutal marriage, a victim of her own naivety and Heathcliff's vengeance. Meanwhile, the presence of Heathcliff and Isabella at Wuthering Heights exacerbated the tensions between the two households. Catherine's health began to deteriorate under the strain of the renewed emotional conflict. The intensity of her feelings for Heathcliff and the guilt she felt for betraying Edgar tore her apart. Catherine was caught in a storm of emotions, Nellie recalls. Her love for Heathcliff was as strong as ever, but she was also deeply attached to Edgar. The conflicting loyalties and the constant turmoil took a severe toll on her health. Catherine's condition worsened, and she became increasingly fragile, both physically and emotionally. Edgar, devoted and caring, did everything he could to nurse her back to health, but the underlying cause of her illness was beyond his understanding or control. Heathcliff's presence acted like a poison, exacerbating her already delicate state. One night, during a particularly heated argument between Heathcliff and Edgar, Catherine collapsed, Nellie recounts, her voice heavy with emotion. The confrontation had been the final straw, pushing her beyond her limits. She was bedridden, her strength ebbing away with each passing day. As Catherine lay on her deathbed, the true depth of her feelings for Heathcliff came to the fore. In a heartbreaking moment of clarity, she expressed her undying love for him, even as she acknowledged the impossibility of their situation. Heathcliff, devastated by the sight of her suffering, could not conceal his own anguish. Catherine's final days were filled with sorrow and regret, Nellie says, tears glistening in her eyes. She knew that her choices had led to this moment, but she also knew that her love for Heathcliff was something that transcended all reason and logic. It was a love that consumed her, body and soul. Catherine died shortly after giving birth to her daughter, also named Catherine, Cathy. Her death was a crushing blow to both Edgar and Heathcliff. Edgar, though heartbroken, devoted himself to raising their daughter, finding some solace in her presence. Heathcliff, on the other hand, was consumed by grief and rage. He cursed Catherine for leaving him and for the unbearable pain her death had caused him. Heathcliff's grief turned into a burning desire for revenge, Nellie says. He blamed everyone for Catherine's death, Edgar, Isabella, Hindley, even himself. His heart, already hardened by years of suffering, became a vessel of unrelenting vengeance. With Catherine gone, Heathcliff's actions became even more ruthless. He continued to manipulate and torment those around him, particularly Hindley and Isabella. Hindley, already a broken man, sank deeper into his vices, while Isabella endured Heathcliff's cruelty, her life at Wuthering Heights a living nightmare. Heathcliff's revenge knew no bounds, Nellie continues. He took particular delight in degrading Hareton, Hindley's son, treating him as Hindley had once treated him. Hareton, an innocent victim in the cycle of revenge, grew up in an environment of neglect and abuse, ignorant of his true heritage. 
Despite his seemingly boundless cruelty, Heathcliff's actions were driven by his unending love for Catherine. His desire for revenge was intertwined with his grief, and every act of cruelty was a reflection of his own torment. The more he hurt others, the more he fed the emptiness inside him. Love and revenge had become indistinguishable in Heathcliff's mind, Nelly says softly. He could not let go of Catherine, even in death. Her memory haunted him, driving him to inflict the pain he felt on everyone around him. As Nelly concludes her recounting of these dark and turbulent times, Mr. Lockwood is left with a profound sense of the tragic nature of the story. Heathcliff's transformation from a passionate lover to a vengeful tyrant underscores the destructive power of unfulfilled love and unresolved grievances. The legacy of Wuthering Heights, with its tales of love, betrayal, and revenge, is a testament to the enduring and often tragic complexities of the human heart. Lockwood, deeply moved and haunted by Nellie's tale, realizes that the story of Wuthering Heights is far from over. The echoes of the past continue to reverberate through the halls of the old estate, influencing the lives of those who remain. As he prepares to leave for the night, he thanks Nellie for sharing her story, knowing that he has only just begun to understand the depths of the tragedy that has unfolded at Wuthering Heights. The chapter ends with Lockwood contemplating the nature of revenge and the ways in which love can drive people to unimaginable lengths. The story of Heathcliff and Catherine is one of intense passion and profound loss, a tragic reminder of the lengths to which the human heart can go in its pursuit of both love and vengeance. Chapter 6 Catherine's Turmoil The intricate tapestry of Wuthering Heights continues to unfold as Nellie Dean delves deeper into the heart-wrenching saga. Mr. Lockwood, now fully engrossed in the tale, listens intently as Nellie recounts the turbulent times that followed Heathcliff's return, a period marked by profound emotional conflict and the devastating consequences of unchecked passions. The return of Heathcliff was a catalyst that threw Catherine Earnshaw's life into disarray. His presence was a constant reminder of the intense and tumultuous bond they once shared, and it disrupted the fragile peace she had found with Edgar Linton. Catherine's heart was a battleground, torn between her enduring love for Heathcliff and her commitment to Edgar. Heathcliff's return unsettled Catherine deeply, Nellie begins. She had hoped to find some semblance of peace and stability at Thrushcross Grange, but with Heathcliff back, all those hopes were dashed. His presence awakened old emotions and reignited the conflict that had never truly been resolved. Catherine's distress was palpable. She oscillated between moments of intense passion and profound despair, unable to reconcile her feelings. The internal conflict began to take a toll on her health, both physically and mentally. She became increasingly agitated, her once vibrant spirit now overshadowed by a deep and pervasive melancholy. Heathcliff's return was like a storm battering her soul, Nelly says, her voice heavy with emotion. She loved him with a fierce and consuming passion, but she also cared deeply for Edgar. The strain of trying to balance these conflicting loyalties was more than she could bear. Adding to the turmoil was Heathcliff's calculated move to court Isabella Linton, Edgar's innocent and naive sister. Heathcliff's intentions were far from noble, he saw Isabella as a means to further his revenge against Edgar and to hurt Catherine. He played the part of a charming suitor, all the while hiding his true, vengeful motives. Isabella was infatuated with Heathcliff, Nellie recounts. She saw him as a romantic figure, dark and mysterious, and she was completely blinded by her emotions. Despite Catherine's warnings and Edgar's protests, Isabella was determined to marry Heathcliff, believing that he truly loved her. 
Catherine's attempts to dissuade Isabella were desperate and heartfelt. She knew the true nature of Heathcliff's feelings and the darkness that lurked within him. Her warnings, however, fell on deaf ears. Isabella was entranced by Heathcliff, and her infatuation rendered her impervious to reason. Catherine tried to make Isabella see the truth, Nellie says with a sigh. She told her about Heathcliff's capacity for cruelty and his vengeful nature, but Isabella was too smitten to listen. She saw only what she wanted to see, a romantic hero who would sweep her off her feet. Isabella's elopement with Heathcliff was a blow that Catherine could not withstand. The emotional strain of Heathcliff's return, coupled with the knowledge that he had married Isabella to spite her and Edgar, proved too much. Catherine's health, already fragile, began to deteriorate rapidly. Catherine's illness was a reflection of her inner turmoil, Nellie explains. She was consumed by guilt, love, and a sense of betrayal. Her body could not withstand the emotional storm that raged within her, and she fell gravely ill. As Catherine lay bedridden at Thrushcross Grange, the true extent of Heathcliff's cruelty towards Isabella became evident. Heathcliff, having achieved his goal of hurting Edgar and Catherine, now turned his wrath upon his new wife. Isabella, who had once believed herself to be the object of Heathcliff's affection, found herself living a nightmare. Isabella soon realized the grim reality of her situation, Nellie says, her voice tinged with sorrow. Heathcliff's treatment of her was nothing short of barbaric. He saw her as a means to an end, and once he had achieved his goal, he discarded her with cold indifference. Isabella's life at Wuthering Heights was a stark contrast to the sheltered and genteel existence she had known at Thrushcross Grange. Heathcliff's cruelty knew no bounds. He subjected her to constant humiliation and abuse, treating her more like a prisoner than a wife. The household, already steeped in misery and dysfunction, became even darker with Isabella's presence. Wuthering Heights under Heathcliff's rule was a place of despair, Nellie continues. Isabella, once full of life and hope, was reduced to a shadow of her former self. She had been lured into a trap, and there was no escape from the hellish existence she now endured. Isabella's letters to her brother, Edgar, painted a grim picture of her life with Heathcliff. She described the torment she suffered and pleaded for his help. Edgar, though furious with Heathcliff, felt powerless to intervene. His primary concern was Catherine, whose condition was growing more critical by the day. Edgar was torn, Nellie says. He wanted to rescue his sister, but he could not leave Catherine's side. She needed him and he was determined to be there for her, no matter what. The situation was a tragic tangle of conflicting duties and helplessness. Catherine, in her weakened state, was acutely aware of the suffering around her. Her heart ached for Isabella, and she felt a profound sense of guilt for the role she believed she had played in the unfolding tragedy. Her own suffering was compounded by the knowledge that those she loved were also in pain. Catherine's illness was not just physical, Nellie explains. It was the manifestation of her broken heart and troubled mind. She felt responsible for Isabella's plight and for the chaos that had engulfed their lives. The weight of it all was too much for her to bear. As Catherine's condition worsened, the atmosphere at Thrushcross Grange grew increasingly sombre. Edgar, though steadfast in his devotion, could see that the woman he loved was slipping away. His heart was breaking, but he held on to the hope that Catherine might recover. Edgar's love for Catherine was unwavering, Nellie says, her voice filled with admiration. 
he stayed by her side, caring for her with a tenderness that was both beautiful and tragic. He refused to give up on her, even as the light in her eyes began to fade. In her final days, Catherine's thoughts turned to Heathcliff. Despite everything, her love for him remained as fierce as ever. She longed to see him, to find some form of reconciliation or closure. Her emotions were a maelstrom of love, anger, and regret. Catherine's love for Heathcliff was the most intense and enduring force in her life, Nellie reflects. Even on her deathbed, she could not let go of him. Their connection was something that defied all logic and reason. It was as if they were two halves of the same soul, destined to be together, yet forever torn apart. Heathcliff, too, was consumed by his love for Catherine. Despite his actions and the path of vengeance he had chosen, his feelings for her never waned. When he learned of her deteriorating condition, he rushed to her side, driven by a desperate need to see her one last time. Their final meeting was a heartbreaking and intense encounter, Nellie says, her voice trembling. Catherine, weak and frail, was filled with a mixture of joy and sorrow at the sight of Heathcliff. Their conversation was a torrent of emotions, love, anger, regret, and a profound sense of loss. Catherine's dying moments were marked by the presence of both the men she loved. Heathcliff, though filled with anguish, could not bring himself to forgive or forget. Edgar, heartbroken, watched as the woman he adored slipped away, her spirit finally succumbing to the relentless storm of emotions that had ravaged her. Catherine's death was the culmination of a tragic love story, Nellie concludes, her eyes glistening with tears. Her life was a testament to the power of love and the devastating consequences of choices made in its name. Her passing left a void that could never be filled, a haunting reminder of the complexities and contradictions of the human heart. With Catherine's death, the lives of those at Wuthering Heights and Thrushcross Grange were irrevocably changed. Heathcliff, now more driven by revenge than ever, continued his campaign of cruelty and manipulation. Edgar, though devastated, found solace in his daughter, Cathy, who bore a striking resemblance to her mother. As Mr. Lockwood listens to Nellie's poignant recounting, he is struck by the intensity of the emotions and the tragic beauty of the story. The saga of Wuthering Heights, with its tales of love, betrayal, and vengeance, leaves him with a profound sense of melancholy and a deeper understanding of the human condition. The chapter closes with Lockwood reflecting on the nature of love and the ways in which it can both uplift and destroy. The tale of Catherine and Heathcliff is a stark reminder of the complexities of the human heart and the tragic consequences that can arise when love is entwined with vengeance and regret. The story of Wuthering Heights continues to resonate, its echoes reverberating through the lives of all who are touched by it. Chapter 7 Birth and Death In the shadow of Wuthering Heights, life and death often entwined in a cruel dance, leaving behind a legacy of heartbreak and despair. Mr. Lockwood, still captivated by Nellie Dean's poignant narrative, prepares to hear of the next chapter in this saga, a chapter marked by profound sorrow and the fleeting joy of new life. As Catherine Earnshaw's condition continued to decline, the once vibrant woman was reduced to a frail and delicate shadow of her former self. The emotional turmoil, the relentless internal conflict, and the physical strain had taken their toll. Her relationship with Heathcliff had been both her greatest passion and her undoing. Catherine's health was in a precarious state, Nellie begins, her voice filled with a quiet sadness. She was weakened by the ceaseless emotional storm raging within her. 
Her spirit, so wild and untamed, was gradually being extinguished by the relentless anguish of her heart. In the midst of this turmoil, Catherine discovered that she was pregnant. The news brought a complicated mix of emotions to Thrushcross Grange. Edgar, despite his profound concern for Catherine's health, found a glimmer of hope in the prospect of fatherhood. He devoted himself even more to her care, hoping against hope that the impending birth might bring some measure of joy and healing. Edgar was overjoyed and terrified, Nellie continues. He clung to the hope that the birth of their child might somehow save Catherine, might give her a reason to fight and recover. He lavished her with attention and care, never leaving her side for long. As Catherine's pregnancy progressed, her condition remained perilous. The emotional strain of her complicated relationship with Heathcliff, coupled with the physical demands of her pregnancy, left her exhausted and vulnerable. The once strong and resilient woman now appeared fragile and WAN, a mere shadow of her former self. Catherine was caught in a relentless struggle, Nellie explains. Her love for Heathcliff, her commitment to Edgar, and the impending arrival of her child created a tumultuous mix of emotions that she could scarcely bear. She was torn between her conflicting loyalties and the harsh realities of her frail health. The day of reckoning arrived on a stormy night, a fitting backdrop for the tempestuous life of Catherine Earnshaw. Amidst the howling wind and lashing rain, Catherine went into labour. The household was thrown into a state of frantic activity, with Edgar hovering anxiously and Nellie trying to maintain a semblance of calm. The night Catherine gave birth was one of the longest and most harrowing nights I can remember, Nellie recounts, her voice trembling with the memory. The storm outside seemed to echo the turmoil within the house. Catherine's labor was difficult and prolonged, and we all feared for her life. After hours of intense labor, Catherine gave birth to a daughter, Kathy. The child, though small and fragile, was a beacon of hope amidst the prevailing darkness. However, the joy of Kathy's birth was swiftly overshadowed by Catherine's rapidly deteriorating condition. Kathy's arrival was bittersweet, Nellie continues, her eyes glistening with unshed tears. She was a beautiful, delicate child, but Catherine's strength was spent. She had given everything she had to bring her daughter into the world, and there was nothing left to sustain her. As the hours passed, it became clear that Catherine was not going to recover. Her breathing grew shallow, and her once bright eyes began to dim. Edgar, heartbroken and desperate, held her hand, whispering words of love and encouragement, hoping against hope for a miracle. Edgar's love for Catherine was boundless, Nellie says softly. He refused to leave her side, even as the reality of her impending death became undeniable. His heart was breaking, but he remained steadfast, offering her whatever comfort he could. Catherine, in her final moments, found a fleeting sense of peace. She held her newborn daughter, looking into her tiny, innocent face, and felt a profound sense of love and sorrow. Her thoughts, however, also turned to Heathcliff, the man who had been the other half of her soul. Catherine's love for Heathcliff never wavered, even in death, Nellie reflects. She was bound to him in a way that defied all reason and logic. Her final words were a mixture of love and regret, a reflection of the deep and complicated emotions that had defined her life. With her last breath, Catherine whispered Heathcliff's name, a final testament to the intensity of their bond. Her passing left a void that could never be filled, a haunting reminder of the love and pain that had shaped her life. Edgar, holding his deceased wife and their newborn child, was overcome with grief. 
Catherine's death was a crushing blow to Edgar, Nelly says, her voice filled with sorrow. He had loved her deeply and devotedly, and now she was gone. The only solace he found was in their daughter, Kathy, who bore a striking resemblance to her mother. Heathcliff, upon hearing of Catherine's death, was consumed by a rage and despair that knew no bounds. His love for her had been the central force of his life, and her loss left him adrift in a sea of anguish and fury. He cursed everyone around him, vowing to make them suffer as he did. Heathcliff's reaction to Catherine's death was both heartbreaking and terrifying, Nellie recounts. He raged against the heavens and everyone he blamed for her demise. His grief was a dark and all-consuming fire, driving him to inflict pain and misery on those he held responsible. Isabella, who had been enduring Heathcliff's cruelty, saw an opportunity to escape. Pregnant with Heathcliff's child, she fled Wuthering Heights, seeking refuge from the nightmare her life had become. Her journey was fraught with danger, but her determination to protect her unborn child gave her the strength to persevere. Isabella's escape was an act of sheer desperation, Nellie explains. She had suffered greatly under Heathcliff's tyranny, and she feared for her life and the life of her child. Her courage in the face of such adversity was remarkable. Isabella sought refuge far away from Wuthering Heights, finding sanctuary in a distant town where she could start anew. There, she gave birth to a son, Linton, named after her family. Despite her relief at being free from Heathcliff, Isabella's heart remained heavy with the knowledge that her child would one day be drawn into the dark legacy of his father. Isabella's new life was a mixture of relief and fear, Nellie continues. She was free from Heathcliff's immediate grasp, but she knew that the shadow of Wuthering Heights would always loom over her and her son. Linton, though innocent, was a part of that tragic legacy. Back at Thrushcross Grange, Edgar Linton devoted himself to raising Cathy, pouring all his love and energy into her upbringing. He was determined to shield her from the pain and sorrow that had defined his own life and to give her the happiness that had eluded him and Catherine. Edgar's love for Cathy was boundless, Nellie says, a small smile playing on her lips. She became the centre of his world, a bright spot in the midst of his grief. He was determined to give her a life filled with love and security, something he had always strived to provide for Catherine. Heathcliff, meanwhile, continued his campaign of vengeance. The loss of Catherine had only deepened his resolve to make those around him suffer. He directed his wrath towards Hindley, driving him further into ruin, and continued to treat Hareton with callous cruelty. Heathcliff's heart was a cauldron of bitterness and rage, Nellie reflects. He could not let go of his hatred and it consumed him. His actions were driven by a relentless desire to inflict pain, a reflection of the agony he felt within. As Mr. Lockwood listens to Nellie's narrative, he is struck by the tragic interconnectedness of birth and death at Wuthering Heights. The arrival of Cathy, a symbol of new life and hope, is juxtaposed with the profound loss of Catherine, underscoring the relentless cycle of joy and sorrow that defines human existence. The chapter closes with Lockwood contemplating the enduring impact of Catherine's life and death. Her legacy, carried forward by her daughter, Cathy, and the continued presence of Heathcliff, casts a long shadow over Wuthering Heights and Thrushcross Grange. The story of love, betrayal, and vengeance is far from over, and its echoes continue to reverberate through the lives of all who are touched by it. Nellie's recounting leaves Lockwood with a deep sense of melancholy and a heightened appreciation for the complexities of the human heart.
The tale of Wuthering Heights is a testament to the enduring power of love and the devastating consequences of its loss, a reminder that life's greatest joys and sorrows are often inextricably linked. Chapter 8 The Next Generation As the years rolled on, the legacy of Wuthering Heights and Thrushcross Grange was handed down to the next generation. The tales of passionate love and bitter revenge that once consumed their predecessors began to shape the lives of young Cathy Linton and Linton Heathcliff. Nellie Dean, ever the diligent observer and chronicler of these events, shares the intricate and often heartbreaking details of this chapter with Mr. Lockwood, who listens with rapt attention. Cathy's Sheltered Upbringing Catherine Linton, known affectionately as Cathy, grew up in the protective embrace of Thrushcross Grange. Under the watchful eyes of her father, Edgar Linton, and Nellie Dean, she was shielded from the darker aspects of her family's past. Edgar, determined to give his daughter the happiness that had eluded him and his late wife, ensured that Cathy's childhood was filled with love, education, and gentle care. Cathy was the very picture of innocence and joy, Nellie begins, her eyes softening with the memory. She was bright, curious, and full of life. Edgar devoted himself entirely to her upbringing, striving to provide her with a world far removed from the tumultuous and sorrowful past. Thrushcross Grange, with its serene gardens and stately rooms, became Cathy's world. She was taught to read, to appreciate music, and to be kind-hearted and compassionate. Edgar's influence was evident in her manners and gentleness, traits that endeared her to all who knew her. Edgar's greatest joy was in seeing Cathy happy, Nellie continues. He poured all his love and attention into her, hoping to create a haven of peace and stability. For many years, Thrushcross Grange was a place of tranquility, a stark contrast to the stormy atmosphere of Wuthering Heights. Isabella's death and Linton's arrival While Cathy's life was one of relative peace, the shadow of Wuthering Heights loomed ever larger. Isabella Linton's life, after her escape from Heathcliff, had been one of struggle and sorrow. Despite the freedom from her cruel husband, she remained haunted by the past. Her health deteriorated, and she died, leaving her son, Linton Heathcliff, in the care of his father. Isabella's passing was a sad but not unexpected event, Nellie says, her voice tinged with regret. She had suffered greatly, both physically and emotionally. Her death left Linton a frail and sickly boy at the mercy of Heathcliff. Linton's arrival at Wuthering Heights marked a new chapter in Heathcliff's relentless pursuit of revenge. The boy, weak and delicate, was ill-prepared for the harsh realities of his new home. Heathcliff, seeing in Linton a tool for his schemes, cared little for his son's well-being. Instead, he focused on how best to use Linton to achieve his own ends. Heathcliff's treatment of Linton was cold and calculating, Nellie explains. He saw the boy not as a son to be cherished, but as a means to an end. His plan was to use Linton to gain control over Thrushcross Grange, thereby completing his revenge against Edgar. Heathcliff's scheme Heathcliff's machinations were as cunning as they were cruel. He knew that if Linton married Cathy, he could secure Thrushcross Grange through his son's inheritance. To this end, he began to orchestrate events to bring the two young people together, exploiting Linton's frail health and Cathy's compassionate nature. Heathcliff was nothing if not strategic, Nellie says with a sigh. He understood human nature and used that knowledge to manipulate those around him. He encouraged Linton to write to Cathy, playing on her sympathy and curiosity. Cathy, 
unaware of the dark motives behind the letters she received, was intrigued by her cousin. The idea of having a relative, someone of her own age, piqued her interest. She longed to meet him, driven by a natural curiosity and a kind-hearted desire to offer friendship. Kathy's nature was such that she could not ignore someone in need, Nellie recounts. She was drawn to Linton's letters, which painted him as a lonely and suffering boy. Her heart went out to him, and she resolved to befriend him, not knowing the true extent of Heathcliff's schemes. First Meeting The first meeting between Cathy and Linton was orchestrated by Heathcliff with calculated precision. He ensured that the encounter would evoke the maximum amount of sympathy from Cathy while furthering his own nefarious plans. Linton, coached by his father, played the part of the helpless, ailing boy to perfection. Cathy was deeply moved by Linton's plight, Nellie continues. Seeing him so weak and fragile, she felt a strong urge to protect and comfort him. Heathcliff's manipulation was working, Cathy was being drawn into his web. The meetings between Cathy and Linton became more frequent, each one further entangling her in Heathcliff's plans. Linton, though genuinely suffering, was also aware of his father's expectations and did his best to meet them, hoping to gain some measure of favor from the only parent he had ever known. Linton was a pitiful figure, Nellie says, her voice filled with pity. He was caught between his own suffering and his father's ruthless ambitions. Cathy's compassion was his only solace, but even that was tainted by Heathcliff's machinations. Heathcliff's manipulation Heathcliff's manipulation extended beyond merely encouraging the relationship between Cathy and Linton. He controlled every aspect of Linton's life, ensuring that the boy remained dependent on Cathy's visits and sympathy. This dependency was designed to pull Cathy further away from her father's protective influence and deeper into the orbit of Wuthering Heights. Heathcliff's strategy was to isolate Cathy from Edgar, Nellie explains. By making her feel responsible for Linton, he ensured that she would continue to visit Wuthering Heights, despite Edgar's disapproval. It was a cruel and effective method of control. Edgar, seeing the growing bond between Cathy and Linton, was deeply concerned. He feared for his daughter's well-being and was wary of Heathcliff's intentions. However, his attempts to keep Cathy away from Wuthering Heights were met with resistance. Cathy's burgeoning independence and her compassionate nature made it difficult for him to restrict her movements without causing further rebellion. Edgar's dilemma was heartbreaking, Nellie says softly. He wanted to protect Cathy, but he also recognized her growing need for independence. He tried to reason with her, to make her see the danger, but her determination to help Linton was strong. Kathy's growing bond with Linton As Kathy and Linton spent more time together, their relationship deepened. Kathy's genuine affection for her cousin grew, despite the underlying tensions and the manipulation at play. She saw in Linton a kindred spirit, someone who, like her, had experienced loss and hardship. Kathy's bond with Linton was sincere, Nellie reflects. She cared for him deeply, not realizing that her feelings were being used against her. Her compassion and kindness were her greatest strengths, but in this situation, they also made her vulnerable. Heathcliff, ever the puppet master, watched with satisfaction as his plan unfolded. He encouraged Linton to propose to Cathy, knowing that her sense of duty and compassion would likely lead her to accept. Linton, desperate for his father's approval and longing for Cathy's companionship, followed through with the plan, albeit with mixed emotions. 
Linton's proposal was a pivotal moment, Nellie says. Heathcliff's scheme was coming to fruition, but the human cost was immense. Linton was torn between his love for Cathy and his fear of Heathcliff, while Cathy was faced with an impossible decision. Edgar's last stand. Edgar, sensing the culmination of Heathcliff's plot, made one final attempt to protect his daughter. He confronted Heathcliff, demanding that he cease his manipulations and leave Cathy alone. The confrontation was intense, with both men standing firm in their resolve. Edgar's confrontation with Heathcliff was a desperate act, Nellie recalls. He was willing to do whatever it took to protect Cathy, even if it meant facing down the man who had caused him so much pain. His love for his daughter gave him the strength to stand up to Heathcliff. Despite Edgar's efforts, the grip Heathcliff had on Linton, and by extension, Cathy, was too strong. Cathy, caught between her love for her father and her compassion for Linton, found herself in an increasingly untenable position. She was drawn to Wuthering Heights, despite the pain it caused Edgar, unable to abandon her cousin to his suffering. Cathy's heart was torn in two, Nellie says, her voice filled with sorrow. She loved her father dearly, but she could not turn her back on Linton. Heathcliff's manipulation had created a tragic conflict, one that was tearing the family apart. The Inevitable Marriage as Linton's health continued to decline, the pressure on Cathy mounted. Heathcliff's insistence on the marriage became more forceful, and Linton's pleas grew more desperate. Cathy, overwhelmed by the weight of her responsibilities and the intensity of her emotions, eventually agreed to marry Linton, hoping to bring him some measure of peace. Cathy's decision to marry Linton was made out of love and compassion, Nellie explains. She believed that by marrying him, she could provide him with the comfort and care he so desperately needed. She did not realize the full extent of Heathcliff's schemes. The marriage, orchestrated by Heathcliff, was a somber affair, marked by a sense of inevitability rather than joy. Cathy's hopes for a happy union were quickly dashed as the realities of her new life at Wuthering Heights set in. Linton, though overjoyed to be married to Cathy, remained a pawn in his father's game. Cathy's marriage to Linton was a tragic turning point, Nellie concludes, her voice heavy with regret. She had entered into it with the best of intentions, but the reality of life under Heathcliff's control was far from what she had envisioned. The next generation was now fully ensnared in the web of Wuthering Heights. As Mr. Lockwood absorbs Nellie's narrative, he is struck by the cyclical nature of the tragedies that have befallen the families of Wuthering Heights and Thrushcross Grange. The young lives of Cathy and Linton, filled with promise and potential, are now overshadowed by the same forces of love, betrayal, and revenge that consumed their parents. The echoes of the past continue to reverberate through their lives, a testament to the enduring power of the passions that once roared through these hills and moors. Chapter 9 A Forced Union The saga of Wuthering Heights took a darker turn as Heathcliff's insidious plans bore fruit, ensnaring young Cathy Linton in a web of cruelty and manipulation. Mr. Lockwood, now deeply invested in the tale, listened with bated breath as Nellie Dean recounted the harrowing events that led to Cathy's forced union with Linton Heathcliff, the ensuing suffering, and the ultimate triumph of Heathcliff's malevolent schemes. The Coercion and Imprisonment Cathy's agreement to marry Linton though motivated by compassion, was not enough for Heathcliff. Determined to ensure the union occurred without delay, he resorted to increasingly ruthless tactics. Heathcliff's first act was to isolate Cathy from her father, Edgar, and all outside support. 
Heathcliff's cruelty knew no bounds, Nellie begins, her voice heavy with sorrow. He orchestrated events with a precision that was both chilling and devastating. Kathy was lured to Wuthering Heights under the guise of visiting her ailing cousin, but once there, she was not allowed to leave. Kathy's imprisonment at Wuthering Heights was a stark contrast to the freedom she had enjoyed at Thrushcross Grange. The once bright and cheerful young woman found herself trapped in a place filled with darkness and despair. The hostile environment and oppressive atmosphere took a toll on her spirit. Kathy's captivity was a nightmare, Nellie continues. She was kept under constant watch, deprived of her liberty, and subjected to the harsh treatment of Heathcliff. Her pleas for release fell on deaf ears, and her hope of rescue waned with each passing day. Linton, though ostensibly the cause of Cathy's imprisonment, was himself a victim of Heathcliff's manipulation. Weak and fearful, he had neither the strength nor the will to oppose his father. His health continued to deteriorate, making him a frail and pitiful figure in this tragic tableau. Linton's condition was pitiable, Nellie explains. He was terrified of Heathcliff and completely dependent on him. His marriage to Cathy, rather than bringing him solace, only added to his suffering. He was too weak to stand up to his father, and his health declined rapidly under the stress. The Force Marriage Under Heathcliff's relentless pressure, the marriage between Cathy and Linton was hastily arranged. The ceremony, held in the gloomy confines of Wuthering Heights, was devoid of joy or celebration. It was a union marked by fear, coercion, and a profound sense of inevitability. The marriage was a grim affair, Nellie recounts. Cathy, though outwardly composed, was inwardly devastated. She had hoped for a life filled with love and happiness, but instead found herself trapped in a nightmare. Linton, though he cared for Cathy, was too frail to be a proper husband. Heathcliff's presence loomed large over the proceedings, a constant reminder of the power he held over both young people. His satisfaction at the completion of his plan was evident, though it brought misery to those around him. Heathcliff was triumphant, Nellie says bitterly. He had succeeded in binding Cathy to Linton thereby ensuring his control over Thrushcross Grange. His victory came at the cost of immense suffering, but he cared little for the pain he caused. Cathy's Endurance Cathy's life at Wuthering Heights after her forced marriage was one of hardship and endurance. Stripped of her freedom and isolated from her father, she struggled to maintain her spirit in the face of relentless adversity. Her only solace was the hope that Edgar might intervene and rescue her from her plight. Cathy's resilience was remarkable, Nellie reflects. Despite the cruelty she faced, she remained strong in her resolve. She held on to the hope that her father would come for her even as her circumstances grew increasingly dire. Edgar, deeply concerned for his daughter, made repeated efforts to see her. However, Heathcliff's iron grip on Wuthering Heights ensured that these attempts were thwarted. The tension between the two men escalated, with Edgar's health suffering under the strain. Edgar was frantic with worry, Nellie explains. He loved Cathy dearly and could not bear the thought of her suffering. His health began to decline as he desperately sought a way to free her from Heathcliff's clutches. Linton's Decline As Cathy endured her captivity, Linton's health continued to deteriorate. The stress of their situation, combined with his chronic frailty, led to a rapid decline. Cathy, despite her own suffering, did her best to care for her husband, motivated by compassion and duty. 
Linton's condition worsened with alarming speed, Nellie says softly. He became increasingly bedridden and reliant on Kathy's care. Despite the circumstances of their marriage, Kathy's kindness and dedication shone through. She tended to him with a gentleness that was deeply touching. Heathcliff, far from showing concern for his son's well-being, viewed Linton's impending death with cold detachment. His primary focus remained on securing his hold over Thrushcross Grange, and Linton's passing was merely another step in his plan. Heathcliff's heartlessness was appalling, Nellie states with evident disgust. He showed no affection for Linton, viewing him merely as a tool. His callousness in the face of his son's suffering was a stark reminder of the depths of his cruelty. The death of Linton Linton's death was a sad but inevitable conclusion to his short and troubled life. As he lay on his deathbed, Kathy remained by his side, providing what comfort she could. His passing, though expected, was a deeply poignant moment, marking the end of his suffering and the culmination of Heathcliff's scheme. Linton's death was a release, Nellie says with a sigh. He had endured so much pain and fear. In his final moments, he found some measure of peace, knowing that Kathy was with him. Her presence was a small comfort in an otherwise bleak existence. With Linton's death, Heathcliff's control over both Wuthering Heights and Thrushcross Grange was solidified. He wasted no time in asserting his dominance, making it clear that Cathy was now entirely under his power. Heathcliff's triumph was complete, Nellie says grimly. With Linton gone, he had achieved his goal. Cathy, now bereft of her husband and separated from her father, was left to face the full brunt of Heathcliff's tyranny. Edgar's last stand and death Edgar, devastated by the news of Linton's death and increasingly frail himself, made one final attempt to rescue Cathy. Despite his declining health, he journeyed to Wuthering Heights, determined to bring his daughter back to Thrushcross Grange. Edgar's final effort was a testament to his love for Cathy, Nellie recalls, her voice filled with admiration. He faced down Heathcliff one last time, driven by a father's unwavering love. His determination was heroic, even in the face of insurmountable odds. The confrontation between Edgar and Heathcliff was intense, but ultimately futile. Edgar, weakened by illness and grief, was no match for Heathcliff's ruthless determination. He returned to Thrushcross Grange, his heart broken, and his health further compromised. Edgar's return to Thrushcross Grange was a sombre moment, Nellie says, her eyes glistening with tears. He had given everything he had to save Cathy, but in the end, he was defeated. His health failed rapidly after that, and he passed away, leaving Cathy alone and vulnerable. Cathy's Struggle and Resilience With Edgar's death, Cathy's situation grew even more dire. Now fully at the mercy of Heathcliff, she faced a future filled with uncertainty and hardship. Despite the overwhelming odds, Cathy's spirit remained unbroken. She drew strength from her memories of her father and her love for the Grange. Cathy's resilience was extraordinary, Nellie says with pride. She refused to let Heathcliff break her spirit. She found solace in her memories and in the knowledge that her father had loved her deeply. That love gave her the strength to endure. Cathy's time at Wuthering Heights was marked by continuous struggle but she found small ways to assert her independence. Her kindness and compassion, though often met with cruelty, remained steadfast. She befriended Hareton, seeing in him a kindred spirit trapped in a similar plight. Cathy's bond with Hareton was a ray of hope in a dark time, 
Nellie reflects. She saw the goodness in him, despite his rough exterior, and they formed a friendship based on mutual understanding and support. It was a small but significant defiance of Heathcliff's control. The Triumph of Love and Humanity In the midst of her trials, Cathy's inherent goodness began to have a profound impact on those around her. Her friendship with Hareton blossomed into a deeper connection, one based on mutual respect and shared suffering. Their bond was a testament to the enduring power of love and humanity, even in the face of overwhelming darkness. Hareton and Cathy's relationship was a beacon of light, Nellie says with a smile. They supported each other, finding strength in their shared experiences. Together, they began to reclaim some measure of happiness and hope. As Mr. Lockwood listens to Nellie's account, he is struck by the indomitable spirit of the human heart. Despite the relentless cruelty and manipulation that marked their lives, Kathy and Hareton found a way to rise above their circumstances. Their story is a poignant reminder that love, compassion, and resilience can endure even in the harshest of environments. The Legacy of Wuthering Heights The forced union of Kathy and Linton, orchestrated by Heathcliff's cruel machinations, ultimately led to a profound transformation. Though the immediate aftermath was marked by suffering and loss, the seeds of love and humanity sown by Cathy began to flourish. Hare Tun, once an instrument of Heathcliff's revenge, became a symbol of hope and renewal. Cathy's legacy is one of strength and compassion, Nellie concludes. She endured unimaginable hardship, yet she never lost her capacity to love and care for others. Her influence on Hare Tun was profound, helping him to see beyond the bitterness and anger instilled in him by Heathcliff. As the chapter draws to a close, Mr. Lockwood reflects on the powerful narrative he has heard. The story of Wuthering Heights is one of intense passions, tragic losses, and the enduring power of love and resilience. It is a testament to the complexity of human nature and the unyielding spirit of those who refuse to be broken by their circumstances. Chapter 10 The Downfall of Heathcliff The saga of Wuthering Heights took a grim and poignant turn as Heathcliff, having executed his plans of revenge with ruthless precision, found himself trapped in the very web of torment he had woven for others. Mr. Lockwood, eager to comprehend the full arc of this tragic narrative, listened intently as Nellie Dean narrated the slow unravelling of Heathcliff's psyche, driven by an obsessive longing for the late Catherine Earnshaw. The Fruits of Vengeance Heathcliff's relentless quest for revenge had brought him a hollow victory. With both Wuthering Heights and Thrushcross Grange firmly under his control, he had succeeded in exacting retribution on those he blamed for his suffering. Yet, the triumph he had so fervently sought yielded no satisfaction. Heathcliff's victory was empty, Nellie began, her voice tinged with a mixture of pity and contempt. He had achieved everything he set out to do, but it brought him no peace. Instead of feeling triumphant, he was consumed by a profound sense of emptiness. The desolation that followed his conquest revealed the true cost of Heathcliff's single-minded pursuit. His enemies had been vanquished, but at the expense of his own humanity. The once fiery and passionate man was now a shadow of his former self, plagued by a haunting void that no amount of power or wealth could fill. Obsessed with Catherine Heathcliff's thoughts increasingly turned to Catherine Earnshaw, the love of his life whose loss had ignited his vengeful rage. Her memory, instead of fading with time, grew more potent, dominating his every waking moment. The intensity of his obsession bordered on madness. Catherine's memory was a constant presence, Nellie explained. 
Heathcliff spoke of her as if she were still alive, as if he could reach out and touch her. His longing for her grew with each passing day, becoming an all-consuming obsession. The ghostly presence of Catherine seemed to haunt Heathcliff at every turn. He imagined seeing her in the shadows of Wuthering Heights, hearing her voice in the howling winds that swept across the moors. This spectral companionship, though tormenting, was the only solace he found in his solitary existence. Neglect of the estate As Heathcliff's mental state deteriorated, so did his attention to the affairs of his estate. Wuthering Heights, once meticulously maintained as a testament to his control and power, began to fall into disrepair. The physical decline of the property mirrored the disintegration of its master's mind. Heathcliff's neglect was evident in every corner of Wuthering Heights, Nellie recounted. The gardens became overgrown, the buildings fell into disrepair, and the staff were left to fend for themselves. It was as if the life had been drained from the place, just as it had been drained from Heathcliff. His detachment extended beyond the physical upkeep of the estate. The residents of Wuthering Heights, including Hareton and Cathy, were left largely to their own devices. Heathcliff's interactions with them grew sporadic and distant, characterized by an eerie disinterest. Visions of Catherine The boundary between reality and delusion blurred for Heathcliff as he began experiencing vivid visions of Catherine. These apparitions, whether born of a tortured mind or a supernatural phenomenon, intensified his yearning to reunite with her in death. Heathcliff's visions of Catherine became more frequent and more real to him, Nellie said, her voice dropping to a whisper. He spoke of seeing her in the dead of night, of feeling her presence beside him. It was as if her spirit had returned to claim him. These encounters, whether real or imagined, deepened Heathcliff's despair. The visions of Catherine offered a tantalizing glimpse of the reunion he so desperately craved, yet they also underscored the insurmountable barrier between life and death. His desire to join her grew into an obsession that eclipsed all else. Detachment and Despair Heathcliff's detachment from the world around him became more pronounced. He withdrew into himself, speaking less and spending long hours alone, staring vacantly into space. His once formidable presence was now marked by an eerie stillness and an overwhelming sense of desolation. Nellie observed Heathcliff's growing detachment with a mixture of concern and resignation. He was no longer the fierce, imposing figure he had been. He seemed lost, adrift in a sea of his own sorrow. The fire that had driven him was extinguished, leaving only ashes in its wake. This profound despair rendered Heathcliff indifferent to the fate of those around him. The suffering and hardships of others, which he had once orchestrated with malicious glee, now barely registered. His world had shrunk to a singular focus, the elusive spectre of Catherine. A yearning for death. Heathcliff's longing for Catherine evolved into a morbid yearning for death. He became increasingly preoccupied with the idea of reuniting with her in the afterlife. This fixation on death was both a symptom and a culmination of his profound despair. Heathcliff's desire to join Catherine in death became his sole purpose, Nellie continued. He spoke openly of his wish to die, to escape the torment of living without her. It was as if he believed that death would finally bring him the peace he could not find in life. This death wish was not merely a passive desire, Heathcliff actively sought to hasten his end. He neglected his health, refused food, and spent long hours exposed to the harsh elements of the moors, courting the physical decline that would bring him closer to his goal. Final Confrontation with Fate 
The final days of Heathcliff's life were marked by a strange, almost serene acceptance of his fate. His interactions with Nellie and the other inhabitants of Wuthering Heights took on an air of finality, as if he were preparing for a journey from which he would not return. Heathcliff's demeanor in his last days was both unsettling and poignant, Nellie reflected. There was a calmness about him, a resignation to his fate. He seemed almost at peace with the idea of dying, as if he had finally made his peace with the world. His last acts were a mix of kindness and indifference. He made no attempt to further harm those around him, nor did he seek reconciliation. Instead, he seemed to be in a state of introspective reflection, consumed by his own thoughts and the ghostly presence of Catherine. The End of Heathcliff Heathcliff's death when it finally came, was both a release and a culmination of his tragic life. He was found lifeless in his bed, a serene expression on his face that belied the turmoil he had endured. In death, he appeared to have found the peace that had eluded him in life. Heathcliff's death was a quiet end to a tumultuous life, Nellie concluded, her voice heavy with emotion. He passed away in the night, alone but for the memory of Catherine. It was as if she had finally come to claim him, to bring him the solace he so desperately sought. With Heathcliff's passing, the dark chapter of vengeance and suffering that had defined Wuthering Heights came to a close. The legacy of pain and loss he had left behind would take time to heal, but there was a sense of relief that his oppressive presence was finally gone. The Aftermath In the wake of Heathcliff's death, Wuthering Heights began a slow process of recovery. The estate, long neglected, was gradually restored under the care of its new inhabitants. Cathy and Hareton, free from Heathcliff's tyranny, found a way to rebuild their lives and nurture the bond that had grown between them. Wuthering Heights began to heal, Nellie said with a hopeful tone. The darkness that had overshadowed it for so long lifted, and there was a sense of renewal. Cathy and Hareton, united in their shared experiences, looked to the future with a determination to create a better life. The story of Wuthering Heights, with all its passion, tragedy, and redemption, stood as a testament to the complexities of human nature and the enduring power of love and forgiveness. Mr. Lockwood, Having heard the full tale, left with a profound sense of the depth and resilience of the human spirit. Chapter 11 Redemption and Love The bleak history of Wuthering Heights began to show signs of renewal and hope as the next generation, represented by Hareton Earnshaw and Cathy Linton, embarked on a journey of transformation and love. In this chapter, Mr. Lockwood learns from Nellie Dean how the once hostile and divided household gradually became a place where compassion, understanding, and redemption took root, symbolizing the possibility of a brighter future. Hareton's Transformation Hareton Earnshaw, Hindley's son, had grown up in a harsh environment. Deprived of education and subjected to Heathcliff's cruelty, he had become rough around the edges, embodying the wildness and rawness of the moors. His early years were marked by anger and resentment, traits fostered by his upbringing under Heathcliff's tyrannical rule. Hareton's life had been one of hardship and neglect, Nellie begins, her voice filled with empathy. Heathcliff had ensured that he grew up without the advantages that should have been his birthright. Yet, despite everything, there was a spark of goodness in him that refused to be extinguished. Cathy Linton, on the other hand, had been raised in relative comfort at Thrushcross Grange. Her upbringing, though marred by her mother's death and her father's sorrow, had endowed her with a sense of compassion and a desire to see the best in people. When she first came to Wuthering Heights, 
the clash between her refined nature and Hareton's rough demeanor was inevitable. The initial conflict. Their early interactions were fraught with tension. Kathy, accustomed to a life of education and gentility, initially looked down on Hare Tun for his lack of schooling and coarse manners. Hare Tun, in turn, resented her perceived superiority and the privileges she had enjoyed. Their exchanges were often marked by sharp words and misunderstandings. Their relationship began on rocky ground, Nelly recounts. Kathy's pride and Hareton's resentment created a barrier between them. They were constantly at odds, their interactions filled with friction and hurtful remarks. Despite the hostility, there was an undeniable connection between them, a spark that hinted at the potential for something more. As they spent more time together, the initial animosity began to give way to a deeper understanding. Kathy's influence. Kathy's inherent kindness and empathy began to break down Hareton's defenses. She saw past his rough exterior to the wounded soul within, recognizing that his harshness was a product of his environment rather than his true nature. Determined to help him, she began to gently encourage his education, offering to teach him to read and write. Kathy's patience and persistence were remarkable, Nellie says with admiration. She approached Hare Tongue with a genuine desire to help, understanding that he had been denied opportunities that should have been his. Her efforts were met with resistance at first, but she never gave up. Hare Tun, initially suspicious of Kathy's motives, slowly began to respond to her overtures. Her genuine care and the time she invested in him started to chip away at the walls he had built around himself. The lessons they shared became a bridge, connecting their disparate worlds. Learning to read and write was a revelation for Hare Tun, Nellie explains. It opened up a new world for him, one filled with possibilities and a sense of self-worth that he had never experienced before. Kathy's influence was transformative, helping him to see himself in a new light. The Blossoming of Love As Hareton's rough edges began to soften, Kathy's feelings towards him evolved. The initial disdain she had felt was replaced by a deep respect and affection. Hare Tun, too, found himself drawn to Kathy's warmth and intelligence. Their bond grew stronger, rooted in mutual respect and shared experiences. Their relationship blossomed in the most beautiful way, Nellie says with a smile. What began as a contentious connection turned into a deep and abiding love. They brought out the best in each other, each becoming a better person because of the other. Their love story was a stark contrast to the tumultuous relationships that had defined Wuthering Heights in the past. It was a relationship built on mutual support, understanding, and the desire to see each other thrive. Their growing affection brought a sense of hope and renewal to the estate. Heathcliff's Observations Heathcliff, observing the budding relationship between Kathy and Hareton, experienced a complex mix of emotions. His initial reaction was one of irritation and anger, seeing their happiness as a stark reminder of his own lost love and the emptiness of his vengeance. However, as time passed, his perspective began to shift. Heathcliff was initially hostile to their relationship, Nellie recalls. He saw it as a threat to the control he had exerted over Wuthering Heights and the people within it. But as he watched them, something within him began to change. The sight of Cathy and Hareton together, so reminiscent of his own youthful love with Catherine Earnshaw, stirred something deep within Heathcliff. The futility of his hatred and the destructive path he had chosen became increasingly apparent. The love and renewal he witnessed forced him to confront the emptiness of his existence. 
a sense of relief and resignation. As Kathy and Hareton's relationship flourished, Heathcliff began to feel a strange sense of relief. Their happiness and the positive transformation of Wuthering Heights offered a counterpoint to his own bitter experiences. The realization that love and kindness could thrive in the place he had once filled with darkness brought him a measure of peace. Heathcliff's resignation was palpable, Nellie says softly. He began to withdraw, his presence in the household becoming less oppressive. It was as if he had finally accepted the futility of his hatred and the inevitability of change. Heathcliff's growing detachment was marked by a cessation of his vengeful schemes. He no longer sought to manipulate or harm those around him. Instead, he seemed to be in a state of introspection, coming to terms with the choices he had made and the life he had led. The Redemption of Wuthering Heights The transformation of Wuthering Heights under the influence of Cathy and Hareton was profound. The once gloomy and oppressive atmosphere began to lift, replaced by a sense of hope and renewal. The estate, long a symbol of suffering and revenge, started to heal. Wuthering Heights became a place of life and hope, Nellie remarks with satisfaction. The changes brought about by Cathy and Hareton's love were evident in every corner. The gardens flourished, the house was cared for, and there was a sense of joy that had been absent for so long. Their love story, set against the backdrop of a place steeped in pain, was a testament to the resilience of the human spirit and the transformative power of love. It was a redemption not just for Cathy and Hareton, but for Wuthering Heights itself. A new beginning. As Mr. Lockwood listens to Nellie's narrative, he is struck by the profound change that has taken place. The story of Wuthering Heights, once dominated by vengeance and despair, has found a new chapter in the love and redemption embodied by Cathy and Hare Tun. Their relationship offers a hopeful vision for the future, one where the mistakes and tragedies of the past do not dictate the course of their lives. Hare Tun and Cathy represent a new beginning, Nellie concludes with a hopeful note. Their love and determination have breathed new life into Wuthering Heights. They have shown that even in the darkest places, there is always the potential for light and renewal. As he departs from Thrushcross Grange, Mr. Lockwood carries with him the poignant tale of Wuthering Heights, a story of intense passions, tragic losses, and ultimately, the redeeming power of love. The legacy of Catherine and Heathcliff intertwined with the hope and resilience of Cathy and Hare Tun, leaves a lasting impression on him, a testament to the enduring complexity of human emotions and relationships. Chapter 12, Peace at Last The tragic saga of Wuthering Heights reached its poignant conclusion with the death of Heathcliff, a man whose life had been consumed by an all-encompassing obsession with the past. Mr. Lockwood, Eager to understand the final chapter of this haunting tale, listened as Nellie Dean recounted the last days of Heathcliff and the enduring legacy of love, loss, and redemption that defined Wuthering Heights. Heathcliff's obsession intensifies. In the days leading up to his death, Heathcliff's obsession with Catherine Earnshaw grew to an unbearable intensity. The vision of her, which had haunted him for so many years, became an almost tangible presence, blurring the lines between reality and his tortured imaginings. Heathcliff's every thought and action seemed to revolve around the spectral image of his lost love. Heathcliff's fixation on Catherine reached a fever pitch, Nellie began, her voice tinged with sorrow. He would speak of her as if she were in the room with him, as if he could see and touch her. His longing for her presence was palpable, and it consumed him entirely. Heathcliff's behavior became increasingly erratic. He wandered the moors at all hours, 
often returning soaked to the skin and shivering from the cold. His physical decline was starkly apparent, he grew gaunt and hollow-eyed, his once fierce demeanor replaced by a haunting vacancy. He stopped eating, refusing even the most basic sustenance, as if to hasten his departure from the world that had brought him so much pain. Withdrawal from the world Heathcliff's withdrawal from those around him was marked by an eerie silence and a profound sense of detachment. He no longer engaged with the inhabitants of Wuthering Heights, retreating into himself and the memories that tormented him. His once commanding presence faded into a ghostly echo of the man he had been. Heathcliff became a shadow, Nelly recalled. He spoke to no one, acknowledging neither friend nor foe. His world had shrunk to the confines of his own mind, where he seemed to live in a perpetual state of mourning and yearning. The isolation he imposed upon himself was absolute. Even Hareton and Cathy, whose burgeoning love and hope had begun to breathe new life into the household, could not penetrate the fortress of sorrow Heathcliff had built around himself. He avoided their company, retreating to the solitary confines of Catherine's old room, where he spent hours staring into the darkness. The final night. The end came quietly, without the dramatic flourish that had marked so much of Heathcliff's life. One stormy night, as the wind howled around the ancient walls of Wuthering Heights, Heathcliff's long struggle finally came to an end. Nellie, who had kept a vigilant watch over him, discovered his lifeless body the next morning. I found him in Catherine's old room, Nellie said, her voice breaking with emotion. He was lying on the bed, his eyes closed, and a strange, serene expression on his face. It was as if he had finally found the peace that had eluded him in life. Heathcliff's death, though expected, cast a pall over the household. The man who had dominated the lives of those at Wuthering Heights for so long was gone, leaving behind a legacy of pain and passion. Yet, in his final moments, there was a sense of release, as if he had been reunited with the only person who had ever truly mattered to him. A serene expression. The serene expression on Heathcliff's face in death was a stark contrast to the torment he had endured in life. It was as if, in those final moments, he had found solace in the thought of being reunited with Catherine. The peaceful look suggested that, at last, he was free from the chains of his earthly suffering. He looked almost happy, Nellie reflected. It was a strange sight, given the torment he had lived through. But in death, he seemed to have found a semblance of the peace he had longed for. The staff and remaining inhabitants of Wuthering Heights, though relieved to be free of his oppressive influence, could not help but feel a measure of pity for Heathcliff. His life, marked by such intense passion and relentless vengeance, had ended in a quiet, almost anticlimactic manner. Yet, the peace on his face suggested a resolution, a final chapter in his tragic love story with Catherine Earnshaw. Lockwood's Reflections and Visit to the Graves Mr. Lockwood having heard the entirety of the tale from Nellie, felt compelled to visit the graves of those whose lives had been so deeply intertwined. He made his way to the churchyard where Catherine Earnshaw, Edgar Linton, and now Heathcliff lay buried. The sight of their graves, side by side, struck him with a profound sense of the enduring legacy of their tragic story. The graves were a sombre reminder of the lives and loves that had been lost, Lockwood mused. Catherine and Edgar, resting peacefully, and Heathcliff, finally at peace beside them. It was a poignant tableau, encapsulating the sorrow and the passion that had defined their lives. As he stood by their graves, Lockwood contemplated the cycles of love and revenge that had played out at Wuthering Heights. 
The story, filled with so much pain and suffering, also held within it the seeds of redemption and hope. The love between Kathy and Hareton, a love that had flourished despite the darkness, symbolized the possibility of a brighter future. The New Beginning at Wuthering Heights The transformation of Wuthering Heights, under the influence of Kathy and Hareton's love, was a testament to the resilience of the human spirit. The estate, once a place of desolation and despair, began to show signs of renewal. The gardens, once overgrown and neglected, were tended to with care. The house, filled with the laughter and warmth of its new inhabitants, no longer echoed with the ghosts of the past. Wuthering Heights began to heal, Nellie said with a hopeful smile. Kathy and Hareton's love brought new life to the place. Their determination to create a better future, free from the shadows of the past, was evident in every corner of the estate. The bond between Kathy and Hareton grew stronger with each passing day. Their relationship, built on mutual respect and shared experiences, provided a stark contrast to the tumultuous and destructive relationships of the past. They found joy in simple things, in the shared labor of restoring the estate, and in the quiet moments they spent together. End of the Cycle of Revenge Heathcliff's death marked the end of a cycle of revenge that had dominated Wuthering Heights for so long. With his passing, the oppressive atmosphere of bitterness and anger began to lift. The new generation, represented by Kathy and Hareton, offered a promise of healing and renewal. Kathy and Hareton's love was a beacon of hope, Nellie concluded. It showed that even in the darkest places, there is always the potential for light and redemption. Their story was a testament to the enduring power of love and the possibility of a brighter future. As Mr. Lockwood prepared to leave Wuthering Heights, he carried with him the profound lessons of the story he had heard. The tale of intense passions, tragic losses, and ultimate redemption left a lasting impression on him. It was a reminder that, despite the suffering and darkness that can pervade human life, there is always the possibility of renewal and peace. A Promise of a Brighter Future The story of Wuthering Heights, with its complex interplay of love, revenge, and redemption, ultimately offered a vision of hope. The love between Kathy and Hare Tun, nurtured in the shadow of past tragedies, promised a future free from the cycles of hatred and vengeance that had plagued their forebears. Wuthering Heights stands as a testament to the power of love and the possibility of redemption, Mr. Lockwood thought as he departed. It is a place where the past and present intertwine, but where the future holds the promise of peace and renewal. As he looked back at the imposing structure of Wuthering Heights, now bathed in the soft light of dawn, he felt a sense of closure. The story he had come to learn, filled with sorrow and passion, had found its resolution in the love and hope of a new generation. The cycle of revenge had ended, and with it came the promise of a brighter, more peaceful future for Wuthering Heights and its inhabitants.